Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about diffusion bonding. So let's dive right into it. Now, why do we need something this complex as in like diffusion bonding? Well, the reality is there are many things, especially heat exchangers, things of that nature that has internal geometry, meaning somehow you need a block of material, be it steel, be it aluminum, be it whatever. Uh, and then you have to have things that are inside it. And because of the geometry that is there, it cannot be machined. Basically, if you have to give this curvy path, there is no drill bit that's gonna give you a curvy path. That's not gonna happen. And if you have something even more complex where they have multiple flow paths, it's not gonna happen. So internal geometry is always challenging for human innovation. It's like, uh, we can design a perfectly computer simulator system where it's like, this heat exchanger is awesome, but it has 10,000 internal geometries that how the heck you gonna manufacture it. And welding only works for outside. So even though we know the technology of welding, you, you know how to weld things outside. Even if this uh, sheet stack, you can weld it from the outside. But what the heck are you going to do in these micro channels? You can't even put solder there because if you put solder and you try to uh, solder it, uh, there is a good chance if the micro channels are small enough, the solder will literally block, clog up those channels. So you can't even do that. And welding always leaves an imperfect joint. Now that's a very serious issue if you want to deal with high pressure and high temperature because this is like a T-joint. Now this T-joint versus a T-joint that is directly extruded, hot extruded, that will be much better compared to this one. Now you may be saying like there are some welding that can allow you to achieve like really near perfect system well then near perfect is it's a bit stronger than the uh, core metal but it's not perfect as in like homogeneous meaning the thermal flow efficiency is not the same as if it was like um, you know one core milliliter. meaning if you go into microscope or electron microscope you can just see okay this uh, this is where we have flux this is where we have core metal this is where we have uh, you know invasive metal you can just see it it's never it never go like it can be strong let me that be very clear it can be strong but it can never reach a point where it's like dude this is just one thing and many times to achieve internal geometry, uh, you can take a geometry, slice it up exactly like how a 3D printer does. What a 3D printer does, takes an object, slices into slices. And then you can achieve whatever internal geometry you want if you can slice it properly. And uh, if you are dealing with some heat exchangers that is designed to deal with some industrial load, if the pressure and temperature both can be so high that if you are dealing with some low tier uh, welding apparatus, it will simply not work. So that's why we need something as complex as diffusion bonding. So what does this diffusion bonding mean? It inherently means you get your workpiece hot enough. Now, how hot depends on the metal alloys and all that jazz, but generally it's specified it's around 80% of the melting point of that object. So it remains in a, like what we call plastic deformation stage, not like completely molten, but not completely hard. Basically enough to, so that electron can start jumping. How you have like uh, sodium vapor lamp where electron starts to escape out, same thing. Uh, so then you add pressure, basically your two objects, you heat them up to, uh, not uh, to a point where they start to melt, but to a point where they are like starting to become elastic. Electrons have enough energy, specifically in the surface electrons, not the electrons that are deep inside the network. For that, you have to melt it, but uh, surface, outside surface. And then you apply pressure either by gas, basically you put uh, them in autoclave and you just heat that puppy up, or you put hydraulic systems that are pressuring that puppy up. And then electrons starts to jump. So basically when you put that kind of pressure and circumstances, uh, uh, basically electrons starts to jump what happens when they jump they basically create a scenario where even though you can see the lines uh, it's literally one object like literally because electrons are jumping around and recreating crystals complete crystals have been recreated at this point in time so even if you cut it grind it perfectly flat put it under electron microscope you will not find where the joint was simply because each electron crystals lit uh, basically lattice structure is built in such a way that it's like hey this is one object like for every reason, every testing, it's one thing. Because electron jump, na? like how the heck you have structures? Electrons, uh, now imagine if everything starts to jump, like what we call it, cold welding in vacuum of space. Same thing. It's just electron starts to jump, it completely welded. Meaning, if you look at this object and if nobody told you how it's done, no amount of engineering uh, can ever explain this. It's like Because it will look like, hey, this object literally looks like it has been uh, like, you know, 3D printed. But again, 3D printing also has the layer lines where, wherever the laser is melting it, it has a layer line. It does not have anything because it literally looks like somehow you machined it. Like if you slice it up, oh, it's a CNC machine. But how the heck you are joining the layer? That's how good it is because the crystal growth, the crystals basically grows to a point where it's like no, no single crystal would be like, okay, this is my border. Nah, it will be like completely ingrown. So that's the whole point. That's how the diffusion aspect is like it slowly diffuses over time.
100 percent uniformity can be achieved meaning no matter what technology you use you cannot find where the heck uh, the you know joint starts and joint ends unless you already know how somebody manufactures this it will be very confusing like i had the luxury to see that in uh, really uh, real world use in co2 supercritical system and it was mind-boggling for the first time i hold the piece it's like dude this is a hard piece as in like it literally behaves like no it does not have layers it's like one thing it's mind-boggling so how do you achieve it? Well, you achieve it either in vacuum or inert gas environment. If you are dealing with something that could be very reactive or certain alloys that do not like other gases, you will use vacuum. Or in some scenarios, if you do not want to use hydraulic system, you can use inert gas as a pressurizer. So surface must be very smooth, meaning even though you are talking about like two things that can bond and intergrow, uh, it has to be flat enough, otherwise pressure will deform it. So for that reason, you have to make it as smooth as possible, as economical as possible, because even if the best smooth system, unless you are making a uh, telescope mirror level, it's going to be rough enough where this sort of thing will happen. And then uh, you make it as smooth as possible, and then you pressurize it using hydraulics or high pressure autoclaves, basically how we use with uh, basically carbon fiber you pressurize it with autoclave now it does take time to diffuse bond meaning this process even though you can think like okay i'm just gonna press it it's done no it you need time like uh, every metal alloy every dissimilar alloys they will have a chart about it it's like okay uh, if you are uh, mixing let's say aluminum to copper uh, wait for like eight hours like yeah these sort of things do take time they are like almost like carbon fiber in that regard they take time and they are very slow and methodic kind of system and uh, like you can achieve internal geometry you can see like the water can literally flows inside and outside it's like how the heck that's possible it's not possible no matter what you do it's not possible with cnc or edms it has to be done with diffusion bonding even with 3d printing uh, again layer line will show up in microscope that's that allows you to achieve something that if you slice it up give it to someone who does not understand diffusion bonding they're like how the heck you did this so that's the methodology about it. Again, some scenarios for low cost, they just use vacuum and hydraulic pressure. For some scenarios, if they can afford giant argon tanks, they use autoclave, it does allow like a bit more flexibility. So there are methods. So what are the use of this? A lot of use. Basically, it's metal 3D printing with better results flat out flat out it's a layer by layer you have to think in layer by layer because you are bonding layers how thin can a layer be that's up to you if you can make a layer very thin you can go, go ahead with it that's up to you and the, the heat exchangers that are very famous now it's what we call printed circuit diffusion bonded heat exchanger like why the heck we are using printers the logic is exactly the same that we utilize for pcb manufacturing basically you take steel plate you etch micro channels into it basically you etch and uh, this etching again you will decide it like how thin the lines should be like how deep the grooves should be you will design it based on the gas flow based on the known dynamics and uh, hydrostatic forces you will calculate it and then you're gonna manufacture layer by layer basically one would be hot one would be cold one would be like hot cold hot cold and then you're gonna stack them alternately hot cold hot cold hot cold and then you diffusion bond this puppy and this allows for very high pressure at very high heat loads now of course if you're using aluminum you your heat limited simply because aluminum will become uh, elastically deformed at very low temperature so it, it won't be used if the exhaust temperature could be like you know beyond 350 degrees celsius at that point you will be like bro let's use stainless steel and even if you are going with like ludicrously high heat like jet engine exhaust kind of heat you may be like ah, let's use titanium so uh, most metal can be used let that be clear as long as metal have crystalline structure it can be used heck even some ceramics can be bonded this way so you can do anything and extreme pressure and heat becomes possible and then you, it allows you to extreme high density now that is a very critical aspect for example this sort of heat exchange you can see this is a ruler so these are this kind of thing object they're not that big but here's the they are powerful beyond belief meaning each of them like the smallest one you can find it can easily handle 10 kilowatt of thermal transfer from point a to point b how the heck that's possible? Because if you slice them up, hundreds to millions of micro channels would be there. It's I told you, like this literally can only be done if you do not have diffusion bonding with 3D printing, and that 3D printing will not be as strong as this one. This is the only way we can achieve that kind of stupid density. Like extremely high density of system. Like this is the printed circuit. Like this is the backbone of our industrial world at this point in time. And it allows very high density. Like you can have a heat exchanger that are this tiny and it's like cooling the whole car. It's like, bro, I got this. Like this tiny. It's like, bro, I got this. It's mind-boggling the amount of density that can be achieved.
and uh, if some other scenarios are using it, for example, industrial grade refrigeration units, uh, they achieve low refrigerant requirements, meaning because of the volume being so small, inherently volume is small, uh, you don't need as much coolant, as much refrigerant. So your power consumption goes down simply because you do not have enough refrigerant to cycle around. It's like, okay, but your whole the ton cooling capacity would remain the same, but your gas capacity, basically the refrigerant, the amount of refrigerant will go down. So instead of using, let's say, 100 gram refrigerant, you are using only 30 grams of refrigerant. Now it's, that's a bit extreme but you get the point you can make it very small exponentially smaller that's why i said like the small size is mind-boggling how small you can make it so there are a lot of uses this i'm just showing it like the majority of industry that you can see has this sort of technology built into it so what we can expect in the future well reality is you have to understand one core aspect this idea of oh heat exchanger well everything runs on heat exchanger when i'm talking about like air condition your house generally has a air condition what the heck it has heat exchanger what is in your cpu Heat exchanger. What if you have an actual liquid cooling system? That's a heat exchanger. And again, uh, for next generation of uh, processors, many companies are uh, jumping away from like any sort of machining milling to diffusion bonding because they are realizing like if the next generation processors that will be used in servers will be reaching 500 watt per socket, uh, there is no way they can machine that kind of micro channels for water to cool that. So they have to do diffusion bonding where they will use multiple layers. Again, it will also make it economical, multiple layers, diffusion bonded and voila. You can cool 500 watts of thermal load in such a small space. So heat exchanger is very, is almost like backbone technology. Basically, it's like what is the importance of bearings? Everything runs on it. So same thing was here. Of course, you may not be able to see it, but it's always there. It was there. It is there. It will be there. So if you can make your heat exchanger a little bit better, just a little bit, not too much. Like, okay, my past heat exchanger was, let's say, 98% efficient. This is like 98.5% efficient. That's a lot a lot like idiotically lot the amount of energy would be saved so that's significant enough and all industrial pressure loves high pressure and temperature differentials meaning if you can say like make the hot side really hot they will love it they will love it like it's, uh, many uh, operational efficiency will directly go off if you can just make it hot enough we just can't again old system like basically tube and fin stacks heat exchangers they cannot go that hot this puppy is like bro i got this so you can achieve like this sort of uh, used in LNG industries. It allows like very high level of heat rejection from even such a small space. Like you can say the person and this puppy will have like megawatts of ability of removing heat from point A to point B. It's like mind boggling. Like you see this sort of heat exchangers, they are tiny, but they are measured like the amount of uh, heat they can remove from point A to point B is in kilowatts. It's like, damn, it's so dense. How the heck it's dense? Mathematics. This is the mathematics. Basically, this is a five millimeter by five millimeter channels that you are carving inside a tube. Let's say you are machining it. Somehow you are machining it. You are, have this. So what is the surface area? Surface area is 80 square millimeters. What will happen if you can somehow machine something that is that small as like 0.25 millimeter? Now, your surface area in the outside is exactly the same. Surface area is 484. Like this is the same logic why our lungs work. Our lungs have like generally this is surface area is equivalent to of a tennis court. In that much area, gas is being diffused. That's why we can breathe. So same thing goes here. It's like making it narrow, very small, allows you to have so much contact from fluid A to fluid B that you can dump insane amount of energy in such a small density package. That's why like it, it, it melted my brain. It's like, dude, you're telling me something this small that I can hold in my hand, can somehow transfer uh, fluid energy from fluid A to fluid B to around, around 10 kilowatts. It's like, how the heck? Okay. Mathematics. Again, in this scenario, if you slice it, you will need a, a magnifying glass to even see the channels. The channels will be very tiny. So more optimized design, you can make it. Basically, you have to also understand whenever you are dealing with this sort of heat exchanger, there is another side effect of pressure drop. If you put GG amounts of pressure, 500 bars of pressure, the outside would be like very less, 450 or even less than that. And if you do not design it properly, your pressure drop could be very low. So you have to balance these things out. How much pressure drop you have, how much laminar flow you have, because ideally you will have 100% laminar flow for pressure reasons. That's awesome, but here's the, if you have laminar flow, it does not extract energy efficiently. So how do you balance it? That's what you have to do. That's what engineering goes into this. It's like, how do you balance these two vectors? Laminar flow, basically you want as low as possible, turbulent flow as high as possible without having too much pressure drop. So there is always a compromise you have to figure out. So you may have like very high density system, but if you have a pump that can really pressurize these things, awesome. If you do not have a pump that can pressurize at that point, it's like, yeah, this may not be suited for us. So you have to have more optimized designs and it's just 3D printing with layer by layer technology. At the end of the day, that's all it is. 3D printing layer by layer. So even a little bit of improvement in, uh, you know, 
refrigeration systems which is very important for you and me uh, that will translate to a lot of energy saving and like that's why people are moving like this sort of technology is not new let that be very clear this is made in like back in the 70s era for nuclear technology it's ancient technology but uh, realistically the reason why this is becoming mainstream now is that people realize we use this in offshore oil farms where they really need a very small uh, you know high density package it's like it works there why don't we use it here somebody started to do it and there's like other companies are like dude it makes sense let's do it here the more and more people have more competition and more price drop more everybody is like ha huh, this makes awesome sense so now we have lot of competition so we can make amazing piece of engineering with this amazing like the amount of things that can be done with this sort of technology is like uh, even with um, injection molding you have mold the mold requires cooling that's here's deal how the heck you cool it you really can't because it's giant hardened material which has like very low thermal so you need micro channels in it how the heck you drill micro channel you can't so what they do they make it a like a layer by layer by layer layer and then they have like you know micro fluid channels bent to it then they diffusion body then they send it to cnc machine for final uh, shaping and then voila like water is literally 1 or 2 mm away from the plastic it takes the heat away very efficiently plastic gets awesome, awesome crystallization structure your mold lasts much longer and you do not have giant radiator cooling the thing down so awesome everybody wins so this sort of technology is like one of those things that we do not pay attention to but is slowly revolutionizing our day to day life almost like ceramic bearings so this was my presentation on diffusion bonding I hope you liked it. Learn from it. In that case, please give the like button. Share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike. Press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe. Press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.